Would you also join me in reading the scripture this morning? I'm going to ask you to please stand. If you need a Bible, there's one right in front of you in the, in the pew right there in front of you. That'll be on page 968. Could you please turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 15. And again, that's in the, the Bible that's in the pew, page 968. 2 Corinthians 9, 11 through 15, which says, You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the need of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Holy is the Lord, there is no one like you. Giving honor to God the Father, God the Son, our Savior, God the Holy Spirit who applies the work of redemption to us. And to Pastor Gerald and the elders for their faithful and loving service toward us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for shepherding our souls, for caring for us, for helping us to be like Jesus. And to all of you, good morning. Good morning. Ah, much better than the first service. I don't know what was going on. Must not have been enough caffeine this morning. Uh, there. If you are visiting for the first time, I am Eric Redman, an associate pastor. I'd love to welcome you to Calvary Memorial today. Thank you for joining us in the service. You are among an imperfect yet very loving people, and I hope you will experience the kindness of God by being among us today. Before I pray, I want to mention a one-word change in the sermon title that will become evident in the message as I park the car on these verses during the week and looked at how some other versions rendered the Greek terms that I was reading. I, I realized I needed to make a change in the title, but it was too late to get it into the print form, but you'll get the sense of it as we go along. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your presence among us today. Thank you for the joy of song, receiving a missionary report of a thousand people praying to receive Christ. Thank you. Thank you for children that were dedicated before us. Grab hold of their hands. Keep them unto yourself all of, your, all of their lives. Rejoice today, and while we're rejoicing, we ask you to be with our sisters and brothers in Ukraine in Russia, in Israel and Palestine, in Haiti, in Costa Rica. Strengthen your church in all these areas. Open eyes to Jesus for the first time. Bring an end to wars. Reestablish stable governments. Stop trafficking. Have mercy on soldier and civilian alike. Now please meet us in your word today and shape us to be more like Jesus. Conform us to the image of your son. Cause us to put to death those things that do not represent Christ. Make us to take on the character of Christ. Do it so your name is magnified all over Oak Park and all the places where we work and reside and play. Magnify the name of Jesus now. We give your thanks. You give you thanks. In his name we pray. Amen. 
One of the most shocking things we can experience as an interruption to a TV show or as the programming that follows a TV show is an infomercial that shows a child of a cleft palate, malnutrition, or missing limbs in need of our help. The pictures intend compassion, but they are somewhat manipulative, presenting to us the most extreme cosmetic, medical, and economic concerns. The segments try to pull on our heartstrings by adding desperate narration from a soft-voiced host and an appeal from an unseen practical voice of reason. All the while in the background is music more appropriate for a viewing period in a funeral parlor. Please click the channel and find something else is the first impulse I have to such segments. Yes. The people certainly could use medical aid and a change in environmental factors that led to birth defects or post-war consequences. However, I do not want to see those images or even entertain being guilted into giving for those causes. The only appeals as disturbing in this approach are the ones in which a human figure has been replaced by a rescued animal that has been mangled inhumanely. And I say this as a dog lover and one who owns a rehomed poodle in case someone thinks I'm being insensitive toward animals. What if we did scan the QR code on the screen during one of those shows and give to one of the human causes. What would it do? Besides fill my email and text messages with several additional requests, we could save a child's life. Or we could provide help for the cosmetic surgery that for some, would remove the superstitious shame associated with disfigurement or deformity in honor and shame and folkway societies. This would give that child a, a chance to participate in main society's pursuit of happiness. And if the compassion agency is Christian, we could hope also to spread the gospel as we do with our year-end gifts to Operation Christmas Tree and to Angel Tree. Moreover, we could get a little tax relief from our act of charitable giving. What if, however, much more is intended by Christian financial giving to other believers? The relief giving of which Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. What if God is doing much more in and through us even than relieving poverty, providing food and shelter, making it possible for churches to continue gospel work and or giving powerful witness of Christ in the world? What if God intends to give us Christian living surpassing the lives we now have, and that with thanksgiving, as we participate in giving to the relief of the saints who have severe financial and material needs. In this last subunit on the Corinthians giving to the Jerusalem believers in their time of need, Paul pulls back the curtain to expose the superlative effects of our relief giving. Three things, three things I will call superlative effects of relief giving, Paul will say grow from the generosity we show by sacrificing to help our brothers and sisters in need around the world. Now, two important caveats before 
I go into the body of this message. First, if you are listening today as an unbeliever, as a skeptic, as an inquirer, or as a seeker, know that this sermon is not about money, giving, tithing, or is a solicitation to get you to give so we can put a new wing on our church. What this section of scripture talks about is giving to relieve the poverty and suffering of others, much like the way in which you might give to the Red Cross or to UNICEF to provide aid in Ukraine, Russia, Gaza, or Haiti now. You would be giving so that others could be helped. This passage of scripture comes at the tail end of two invitations, or two chapters, excuse me, about an invitation to one church, Corinth, to help another church, Jerusalem. Because those in Jerusalem are experiencing great material and financial need. The invitation recognizes that the ability of the church to proclaim the good news about Jesus dying for sin and rising from the dead rests on the believer's ability to survive practically. The compassionate response also shows the power of the grace of Christ that flows from the message of his death and resurrection, that it is working in Corinth to show love toward those who are in Jerusalem. I am telling you this so that you will know that we are not after your money here. Please keep your money in your purse or your wallet, whether it is real or virtual. Listen without concern about any of that. I want you to be unhindered in hearing what Jesus offers by dying and rising for us, rising from the dead. For my hope is that you will trust your life to Jesus today. And that does not require you to give anything. Second caveat. To follow the example of my favorite Oak Park theologian, I need to explain the format of this sermon. <laughs> I am going to talk of two of Paul's superlative effects of relief giving. The second effect is really made up of four sub-effects, which I will not enumerate. I mean, it's me, you know. <laughs> then I will suggest three applications related to the first two effects. Finally, I will speak of the third effect. So how about that? Yeah. With that outline, I could be G. Eric Heastand. I mean, just. <laughs> Here are your three superlative effects of relief giving. First, the thanksgiving for the gifts will excel our giving. The thanksgiving for the gifts will excel our giving. Many of you know by now this passage concerns Paul's call for the Corinthians to complete their collection to provide relief to their impoverished and suffering sisters and brothers in Jerusalem. In speaking of the results, twice in verses 11 through 12, Paul mentions thanksgiving will go to God. Certainly, as Paul says, the giving will meet real human need. It will not be collected to make some prosperous at the impoverishment of others. Instead, it will be collected to make sure basic sustenance for one group of believers is met by another group of believers. There is no chance in Jerusalem that the believers there could rely on their unbelieving neighbors or the governing forces for relief. If help will come by human means, it will come by the hand of fellow believers. Paul describes the giving as a ministry of service. The terms speak of 
serving that produces a priestly output of public good, a service that produces worship. An effect of the Corinthians' giving is that people acknowledge God being good to them. Paul's team will acknowledge the good and will give thanks to God for his working in the lives of the Corinthians. The body of believers in Jerusalem also will give thanks for the kindness shown by these fellow believers living very far from them. This should have encouraged the Corinthians. For much of what Paul writes to them has little to do with being thankful for good in them. In 2 Corinthians, we have watched with care as Paul has been pulling the Corinthians away from being enamored with the super apostles. The super apostles, who we have learned are not really super, offered a false gospel of credentialed Christianity, avoidance of suffering, and measuring truth by financial prosperity. Even these two chapters, even chapters 8 and 9, are a light correction for the delay in completing the collection for Jerusalem. Then there is the whole of 1 Corinthians, in which Corinth shows concern with divisions, lawsuits, selfish use of spiritual gifts, and the like. Even the mentioned lost letter to Corinth shows they still have approval of those living in sexual immorality. This is the church that would have been the subject of the first century nightly news stories about scandals and corruption. But in giving to relieve the saints, in giving of their own monies to help others, they didn't even know they would find thanksgiving to God abounding for them. Note the superlative terms in the text, overflowing and many. Paul says many beyond the initial recipients will give thanksgiving to God for the Corinthians and their gift. That is, a working of the Spirit of God will take place in the lives of believers near and far because of the Corinthians' giving. Thank you, Lord, for meeting our great needs. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for putting into the hearts of the Corinthians to give in this great manner. Thank you for doing a work in them that outdoes the reputation they had for being a place of trouble. The thanksgiving shows Christ working to produce godliness in the lives of others through the relief giving done by Corinth. Some of our well-known and commonly used modern products were invented as exploration into other ideas. We know that super glue came from researching a means of making stronger airplane windshields. Post-it notes came as the result of an attempt to make a better adhesive for the aerospace industry. Nonstick coating came from trying to make a safer refrigerant. Each of these helpful products are unintended consequences of experiments to create something else. However, the Lord intends to form thanksgiving in us and others. The thanksgiving Paul anticipates coming from, the, from Jerusalem is not an unintended consequence of the Corinthians giving. The Lord intends to make a people who recognize his goodness in all things, which is what thanksgiving says about the one who gives, you, God, have done something good to me through this gift. The Lord intends also for us to seek contentment in what he provides, which is something thanksgiving helps us to do. The Lord intends for us to fight bitterness over what one does not have 
over or what one has experienced as ill and to replace bitterness with acknowledgement of God's goodness toward us. As Pastor Gerald said of joy last week, one does not suddenly have joy in giving. Joy flows from a life of cultivated joy. In the same way, those giving thanks for the good communicated through the gifts given to relieve their suffering do so from a heart disciplined to give thanks in all things and for all things, as the New Testament teaches. It is not a heart that ignores wrongdoing and does not feel real pain. But in the midst of the wrongdoing and in the midst of real pain is a heart that still says, God, you're being good to me in a mysterious way. I do not understand it right now, but I know you are being good. Thanksgiving is not in antithesis to pain. Instead, the Lord intends for all of us to be characterized by a thankful heart. Second, the reception of the relief gifts will magnify the gospel and its grace. The reception of the relief gifts will magnify the gospel and its grace. In verse 13, Paul speaks of the Jerusalem church approving of the Corinthians' gift. There is no connotation of rejection here. Instead, the idea is that the Corinthians are being tested by how they treat these fellow believers in need. When their gift arrives, Jerusalem's church will see that Corinth has genuine faith. For only genuine faith would make the people give to a church suffering impoverishment. Their faith is transforming their pockets their purses and their wallets, their view of money. In their approval of Corinth, they will glorify God because the Corinthians have an obedient faith to match their confession of Christ. Their confession of Christ is not mere words or a set of ideas that produces no works that would benefit humanity. The Corinthians show that they have submitted themselves to the loving prodding of the gospel. They show that their hearts are pliable rather than stingy, compassionate rather than greedy, and sober about the future rather than selfish about the present. They understand that we are going somewhere where we cannot take anything earthly with us, and we have far more waiting for us over there than we will ever have down here so we can readily give stuff away. Or as New Testament scholar Linda Belleville says, quote, the Corinthians willing contribution to the Jerusalem collection shows that they possess a faith that accepts the claims of the gospel and obeys its dictates as well, unquote. The Jerusalem church also will glorify God for the generosity of their contribution, Paul says, or better rendered, simplicity of their fellowship. Praises will go up from Jerusalem because the saints in Corinth will do something beyond normal human interest. They will look past the Jewish identity of the church in Jerusalem and as Gentiles will give because they find fellowship with those in Jerusalem. The word you have in your text there for contribution in the ESV is translating the word for fellowship. In this age, we know these actions are worth praising God. The Corinthians traverse ethnic boundaries to send their gifts to the saints in Jerusalem, to the Jewish church. This would show the Lord working among the Gentiles to bring about the fulfillment of his plan to reach people from all nations with the gospel. 
Corinth recognizes that because of the dying and rising of Jesus, that they have fellowship, partnership, deep commonality with Jerusalem and all other believers affected by their generosity. God's name will be exalted because he, by his power, has wed together two congregations in love who have never met one another. They join across cultural lines simply because of Jesus. What the Lord is doing in us is bigger than any one local congregation or one ethnic group of believers. Paul further tells Corinth that their Jewish sisters and brothers will long for them and pray for them as they witness the grace of God doing an incredible work in them when the Corinthians are emptying their jars of Roman coinage. Their giving of their few copper pieces shows surpassing grace, Paul says. Note again the superlative term, surpassing grace. It is recognizing this working in the Corinthians that makes the Jewish believers have affectionate desire for them, wanting to be with those in whom the Lord is working so marvelously. It provokes the Jerusalem church to pray for those in Corinth, to seek the Lord on behalf of their good. Their prayers for Corinth probably included requests for the Lord to bless Corinth in abundance, materially and financially, because of their gifts. Glorifying God for obedience and fellowship, longing for believers and praying for them, Jerusalem magnifies the gospel and its grace working in the Corinthians as they receive the gift. All this spirit wrought work, all this praise to our king and love abounding from one group of believers to another comes about because those in Corinth give to Jerusalem what they could easily have kept for themselves. Let's now consider how we might move toward beginning or increasing our relief giving with just three points of application. Number one, ask the Lord to increase our compassion for the hurting, but with discernment. Ask the Lord to increase your compassion for the hurting, but with discernment. While none of us want to be manipulated by elaborate marketing strategies to wrest money from us to help children who go without food regularly. We need the Lord to work in us to keep our hearts from being closed to the needs he is calling us to service. Pastor Gerald already has said that we cannot meet every need, but there are many opportunities presenting themselves to us. Only as our compassion increases, only as our hearts warm toward those who are hurting, can we make choices toward more sacrificial relief giving, relief giving that will magnify the gospel and the working of its grace. But we have to be discerning in deciding when and where to give. Number two, start with monthly setting aside the equivalent cost. Let me go back. Start with monthly, once a month, setting aside the equivalent cost of one restaurant bought coffee, one restaurant meal, and one movie viewing to give relief to the suffering of other believers. For anyone who doesn't have it in your budget to give sacrificially to help relief efforts, as you have heard the past few weeks in these chapters, please don't give. Our God is not begging anyone 
to give. Our church is not begging anyone to give. God loves a cheerful giver and wants us to give of our own free wills. If we don't have it, then we have no obligation to give it. But if you purchase one cup of coffee from a store rather than making it at home and or you eat out once a month rather than eating at home and or you go to the movies once a month, even if the form is renting a movie at home, you can afford to give all of that leisurely spending to help relieve the suffering of others. Amen goes right there. <laughs> That's in the neighborhood of about 10 to 12 dollars a month on the low end. And by the low end, I mean if you only get a small 7-Eleven cup of coffee, a kid's meal at a restaurant, and the lowest movie rental price. <laughs> That's about 10 to 12 dollars a month. But what seems like little to you and me, when added with all the rest of our giving, can go far in changing the lives of saints in poor regions of the city and of the world. It will go much farther than the movie or meal or one cup of coffee that we have missed this month. Number three, consider volunteering to serve those in greater need within proximity to us. We already are involved in a handful of such projects at Calvary Memorial. The refugee crises, plural, are adding opportunities daily as our call to partner with World Relief shows. For some of us, we need to put a personal, proximate face on a need before our pockets will follow. Finally, the third thing this entire process of giving and its effects will do is exalt the gift of God. It will exalt the gift of God. Paul has found several effects of the saints being relieved. One, it produces thanksgiving in Paul, his team, and the saints at Jerusalem. Two, it brings praise to God for his working in the relief. Three, it will make the recipients pray for and long for the saints who sent the relief, tying the two local bodies of believers together through the Spirit, by the cross, and the empty tomb across great geographical distance. But the final effect of which Paul speaks in 915 moves away from human relief giving to God's relief giving. Paul looks at what human relief giving of money does for those in material need by grace. But then it seems that he ponders upon what the divine relief giving of Jesus does to those of us in spiritual need by grace. How does one speak of what Christ has done in terms of relief when one thinks of all the things he relieves for us in our need? We are spiritually dead. And he becomes poor so he can make us alive in him. Paul puts a thank you, Lord, right here. We are the sinful ones. He will sacrifice himself to impute to us his sinless. Thank you, Lord, for your sinlessness. We are slaves to sin. He will die to redeem us from slavery. Lord, with our whole hearts, we give you thanks for redeeming us. How do you describe this and all other things Christ does to provide for us relief from the great depths of our poverty before God? For Paul, the comparison yields something inexplainable, indescribable in its being and its effects. He says, thank you, Lord, for your inexplainable or your indescribable gift. Scholar Mark Seyfried comments on this word coined by Paul, saying, 
it signifies that this gift cannot be recounted, narrated, or told. It implies a story that is beyond all telling, a story that again and again calls for amazement, wonder, and praise. It involves God's self-giving in Christ, the wonder of his taking upon himself our poverty, sin, and guilt, the wonder in which he has made us rich. It includes God's creation of true community in which the reality of giving is present. We cannot go further than a mere outline of the dimensions of this gift. To attempt to define the gift that Paul names, to pin it down and describe it without reserve would be to violate Paul's intentional silence. Seyfried rightly concludes that Paul is saying, we can't find words for what Christ did when the Father came to him and said that the human race is impoverished and suffering before him. There is no way to describe all that has been done. We reach linguistic limits when trying to speak of God relieving anything for we who are totally depraved. So Paul has to invent a word to describe what cannot be described. His word here for inexplainable or indescribable is a word never used before in all of classical Greek literature. Paul's one word is made up of three words that separately mean not, describe, exhaustively. It exhaust description. It is inexpressible. Human words are inadequate to express the worth and magnificence of the person of Christ or what he has done in our divine redemption. We are under God's wrath without hope in this world. And Paul says that we are without God. Jesus the son of 40 and two generations in the plan of redemption will put on flesh for us, will be God's wrath satisfier for us, drinking down the cup of God's wrath to its very dregs. We have broken God's law and deserve all of his curses. Christ hangs on a tree to become a curse for us, to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found. Spiritually, I was the one malnourished. I was the one deformed without limb or life before God, and it was no infomercial in heaven. I deserved hell. I have not obeyed. I came into this world with Adam's sin, but a second Adam went to the tree that gives life, and he was wounded for me. As the hymn writer says, wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions, and now I am free. All because Jesus was wounded for me. Dying for me, the hymn writer says, dying for me. There on the cross, he was dying for me. Now in his death, my redemption I see, all because Jesus was dying for me. Rising for me, rising for me. Up from the grave, he has risen for me. Now evermore from death's sting, I am free. All because Jesus indescribably, unexplainably, all because Jesus has risen for you and for me. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to relieve the suffering and poverty of our sin and the judgment thereof. Thank you that he is risen for us, that he is risen for me. Thank you that this is the motivation by all of our relief giving 
when we see the, this world suffering of others. Oh God, take every bit that we give toward relief and magnify the gospel as it goes. Open hearts to hear the message of Jesus. Make them receptive to hear our partners read from the pages of Scripture. Open blind eyes as they experience the compassionate love of Christ and the message of the gospel follows. Create thanksgiving across the world from people who receive the gifts and thankful hearts in us. May Jesus be praised for being that indescribable gift toward us. We give you thanks. In his name we pray, amen.